In Uganda, a leading member of the opposition Democratic Party, the DP, says Norbert Mao, the group's leader, has relinquished his membership and position after he joined President Yoweri Museveni's government. Mao is now the country's justice minister after signing a cooperation agreement with President Museveni. But some of the leaders from the opposition party accuse Mao of betraying opposition ideals and its supporters. Dr. Lulume Bayiga is a DP member of parliament. He tells viewers Peter Clotty that a letter from President Museveni welcoming Mao to the government is proof that Mao no longer belongs to the opposition party. President Museveni is not interested in the unity of uh, this country per se. He's interested in co-opting voices of people that criticize him about how he rules this country. He could get unity of this country if he wanted to get the prominent people in various parts of this country, build consensus on national ethos, strategic priorities, and generally building consensus on governance and how people desire to be governed in order to cause the national unity. Mr. Baiga, some people are suggesting that that is what the president has been doing. A lot of your uh, opposition political parties have been expressing their views freely in opposition to what he stands for. And he believes that the lack of unity and political divisions in Uganda has negatively impacted the progress that Uganda could have made with unity. Your take? But uh, how can you say that you, you have annexed a party with only nine members of parliament, and you boast that this is what unity is about, unity of the whole country. The national unity platform has the majority in the opposition. If at all it is about national unity, then he should be talking about the whole of the opposition. And this could have been done by listening to one another in a unity dialogue that we have been talking about. Not merely silencing voices of criticism, and killing opposition parties the way he's doing to DP, the way he's doing to FDC, the way he's doing it in NUP, the way he has done it in UPC. It is unsustainable the way he's doing it. That is what I am saying. But, but Mr. Baiga, last time I spoke with President Museveni, uh, he talked about the platform where all political parties discuss issues of national importance, and that he has even made overtures to all political parties parties to come and hash out views about the best steps forward to, one, unite the country, and two, ensure the progress and build Uganda up. And that opposition groups have neglected it, then turn around and accuse him of trying to annex the political parties. What are your thoughts? We had the interpolitical organization for dialogue, but he spoiled the chance to speak to opposition politicians. It is that, uh, under that framework that political parties would come together and build consensus on how each of them is going to conduct itself in the face of Uganda and in service of our country. Authorities in Nigeria's Lagos state have acknowledged that at least 103 protesters died in clashes with security forces during 2020 protests over police brutality, a high figure than previously given. State officials also said they will conduct a mass barrier for the bodies, which they say haven't been claimed by relatives despite public announcements. Survivors and rights groups accuse authorities to try to cover up the true extent of the casualties and crimes committed by security forces and are calling for an investigation. Human rights group Amnesty International is among those calling for a new probe into the October 2020 death of protesters and investigating the government's claims. On Sunday, the Lagos state government said it plans to bury 103 people who died in the state during the various protests and relief overcrowding in the morgue. The official statement came after a memo about the planned mass burial was linked to the media. Activists are now accusing 
the authorities of trying to cover up the extent of the casualties at the Leki toll gate, the site of a hatred crash between protesters and military forces. In response to critics, Nigerian government officials say Monday the bodies to be buried were rounded up from various clashes that erupted across the state, not thoroughly at the toll gate. Lagos state officials say the critics are trying to misinform the public, steer sentiment and cause disaffection against the Lagos state government. Authorities said the measure was a routine exercise to decongest the public morgue and that the bodies remained unclaimed for nearly three years after being deposited there despite public notices. Authorities added that none of the bodies were retrieved from the Lake Toll Gate incident. As we into a military installation, this also underscores its ability to undermine planned military offensive, thus weakening the military operations. Egal says Ashabab seeks to weaken government positions ahead of a second phase operations against the group. Somali's government says it plans to launch a second offensive against Ashabab with the support of neighboring countries such as Kenya, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. He says the attack on Jalesiat Academy is yet another significant message by Ashabab to the Somali government. They are telling the government that the second phase of the operation will be tough and not as easy as the first one. Mahdi Musi Hassan, who teaches security studies at Mogadishu University, told VOA that Ashabab's access to a military installation reflected badly on the image and the capacity of the Somali National Army. In the past, Ashabab infiltrated security installations in the highly guarded places, raising concerns the group has planted operatives within these tackles. Uh, Hassan says the entry of an opposing force into a training base using a suicide bomber will soil the reputation of the government and its forces. It also damages the trust of the forces, the people and the international partners. Hassan dismisses concerns that the increase in Ashabab attacks is a result of the handover of forward operating bases by African Union troops to the Somali National Army. He says the recent Ashabab attacks on the government and areas liberated during the first phase of the operations will not have an impact on security because of the handover by ACNIS since all the operations in those areas were solely carried out by Somali and the Kalan forces. The ATMIS, or African Union Transition Mission in Somalia, concluded its handover of all seven forward operating bases to the Somali National Army by the end of June and withdrew an additional of 2,000 troops. This is in line with the expected exit of all African Union troops from Somalia by the end of next year. Security analysts warned the UN deadline could be ambitious given by Ashabab's resilience and ability. Ahmed Mohammed. For VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. Intense fighting continues in several parts of Sudan as the conflict between the country's army and paramilitary rapid support forces enters its 100th day. Asadullah Nasrullah is the spokesperson for the United Nations Refugee Agency, the UNHCR. VOA's Nabil Biagio spoke with him about the dire consequences that the fighting has brought upon civilians. It obviously had the uh devastating impact, first of all, on the civilians uh, of Sudan. Over 3 million people uh, have been displaced uh, within the country and also moved across the border to uh, the uh, neighboring countries uh, in the region, uh, including to Chad, Central Africa, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and in, in South Sudan. This includes uh, more than 740,000 refugees and also refugees who were in Sudan uh, before the conflict, mainly from South Sudan and some other countries who also uh, returned back to their countries of origin. The countries where they returned to were also in difficult condition. Uh, in addition to that, 185,000 and refugees who were hosted in Sudan uh, were forced to flee and move from the states uh, which were impacted by the conflict uh, to safer uh, areas inside Sudan. So, and also in total, I can say that 2.5 million people have internally displaced uh, within Sudan. These are Sudanese displaced during these 100 days. So, as you can see, 
this is the impact that we can highlight only on the part of the displacement. But obviously, the impacts uh, of the uh, handed days of con conflicts were beyond that. You know, the conflict has resulted in civilian casualties. In days, uh, is also we have received reports of serious human rights violation, including sexual uh, violence and other protection risks that faced uh, by the civilians in Sudan. I saw uh, that many. Many South Sudanese children living in Sudan, for example, White Nile State, have been hit by this measles outbreak. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. We have uh, we have reports of nearly 300 South Sudanese children died uh, because of the measles uh, in the nutrition in White Nile State. And of course, the human rights violations uh, reported, which you, you, you were just telling me about, have been mostly reported in Khartoum, Kordofan and Darfur, the areas hardest hit by the conflict. Is that what your reports say as well? Uh, exactly, because these are the areas uh, Khartoum and Darfur. Uh, in Darfur region, in Cordoba region, are the areas that are hardly hit by the conflict, and therefore we have more uh, more uh, human rights violations uh, in these uh, in these states in region. And Asadullah, you are working in. Um, uh, of course, you had you were forced to relocate to move out of Khartoum of Sudan. Uh, you you currently working from uh, from Istanbul in Turkey. But uh, the humanitarians in Sudan are working in difficult conditions. Uh, the fighting is going on. Now we have the rainy season is setting in. What are some of the challenges uh, your team faces on the ground? And tell me about the status of your funding. Uh, first of all, on the on the humanitarian situation inside Sudan, yes, the the areas, the states in the region that were hit hard by the conflict, it's very difficult for the humanitarian uh, workers to operate. Uh, accessibility is a serious challenge uh, there. Uh, although we we continue to maintain our presence where it's possible. That was Asadullah.